Okay, I'm going to do your speed building today. It's jury charge and words that come out. You have Mr. Foreman. <clears throat> Culpable mental state. Um, don't think there's any proper names. So I'm sorry, that's the wrong one. Okay, you have affirmative defense. Theodore Karnoff, <clears throat> Gregory Pepper. <clears throat> um, notwithstanding. <clears throat> and I think that is it. I will start at 160 <clears throat> and go through 190. So this will be 160 jury charge speed building for five minutes. Ready? The court particularly addresses you, ladies and gentlemen. It is an affirmative defense to the crime of assault in the first degree and to the crime of reckless endangerment that the defendant, Gregory Pepper, used physical force upon the victim, Theodore Carnock. One, in order to defend himself from what he reasonably believed to be the use or imminent use of unlawful physical force by Theodore Karnoff, and two, he used a degree of force which he reasonably believed to be necessary for that purpose. Notwithstanding the above, the defendant is not justified in using physical force if he was the initial aggressor, except that his use of physical force upon another person under the circumstances is justifiable if he withdraws from the encounter and effectively communicates to the other person his intent to do so, but the latter nevertheless continues or threatens the use of unlawful physical force. It is an affirmative defense to the crime of assault in the first degree and to the crime of reckless endangerment that the defendant, one, was in possession or control of any building, realty, or other premises, or was licensed or privileged to be thereon, and two, <clears throat> He used reasonable and appropriate physical force upon another person. Three, to prevent or terminate what he reasonably believed to be the commission or attempted commission of an unlawful trespass by the other person in or upon the building, realty, or premises. Notwithstanding the above, the defendant is not justified in using physical force if he was the initial aggressor, except that his use of physical force upon another person under the circumstances is justifiable if he withdraws from the encounter and effectively communicates to the other person his intent to do so, but the latter nevertheless continues or threatens the use of unlawful physical force. It is an affirmative defense to the crime of assault in the first degree and to the crime of reckless endangerment that the defendant, one, used reasonable and appropriate physical force upon another person, two, when and to the extent that he reasonably believed it necessary to prevent, three, what he reasonably believed to be an attempt by the other person to commit theft. Notwithstanding the above, the defendant is not justified in using physical force if he was the initial aggressor, except that his use of physical force upon another person under their circumstances is justifiable if he withdraws from the encounter and effectively communicates to the other person his intent to do so, but the latter nevertheless continues or threatens the use of physical force the defendant's theory of defense necessitates the adding of a less non-included offense, that of reckless endangerment. A person commits the crime of reckless endangerment if he recklessly engages in conduct which creates a substantial risk of serious bodily injury to another person. The elements of reckless endangerment are therefore, one, recklessly engaging in conduct which creates a substantial risk of serious bodily injury, two, to another person, if, after considering all of the evidence, you find that the prosecution has established beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant, without affirmative defense, acted in such a manner as to so as to satisfy all of the above elements at or about the date and place stated in the information, you should find the defendant guilty of reckless endangerment. 
If you do not so find, you should find the defendant not guilty of reckless endangerment. Concerning the instructions in this case, certain words or phrases have a particular meaning. The following is a definition of one of those words. Recklessly. A person acts recklessly when he consciously disregards a substantial and unjustifiable risk that a result will occur or that a circumstance exists. An unlawful trespass occurs where a person goes on the property of another without a right or privilege to do so. Unlawful trespass does not occur when, in order to secure property of his own, a person goes upon the property of another. If you are not satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant is guilty of the offense of assault in the first degree as charged, he may, however, be found guilty of any lesser offense, the commission of which is necessarily included in the offense charged, if the evidence is sufficient to establish his guilt of such lesser offense beyond a reasonable doubt. The offense of assault in the first degree as charged in the information necessarily includes the lesser offense of reckless endangerment. A person commits the crime of reckless endangerment if he recklessly engages in the conduct which creates a substantial risk or serious bodily injury to another person. The elements of reckless endangerment are therefore, one, recklessly engaging in conduct which creates a substantial risk of serious bodily injury, two, to another person, if after Okay, this will be at 170. Ready? The court particularly addresses you, ladies and gentlemen. It is an affirmative defense to the crime of assault in the first degree and to the crime of reckless endangerment that the defendant, Gregory Pepper, used physical force upon the victim, Theodore Carnot. In one, in order to defend himself for what he reasonably believed to be the use of imminent use of unlawful physical force by Theodore Carnot, and two, he used a degree of force which he reasonably believed to be necessary for that purpose. Notwithstanding the above, the defendant is not justified in using physical force if he was the initial aggressor, except that his use of physical force upon another person under the circumstances is justifiable if he withdraws from the encounter and effectively communicates to the other person his intent to do so, but the latter nevertheless continues or threatens the use of unlawful physical force. It is an affirmative defense to the crime of assault in the first degree and to the crime of reckless endangerment that the defendant, one, was in possession or control of any building, realty, or other premises, or was licensed or privileged to be thereon, and two, used reasonable and appropriate physical force upon another person, three, to prevent or terminate what he reasonably believed to be the commission or attempted commission of an unlawful trespass by the other person, in or upon the building, realty, or premises. Notwithstanding the above, the defendant is not justified in using physical force if he was the initial aggressor, except that his use of physical force upon another person under the circumstances is justifiable if he would withdraws from the encounter and effectively communicates to the other person his intent to do so, but the latter nevertheless continues or threatens the use of unlawful physical force. It is an affirmative defense to the crime of assault in the first degree and to the crime of reckless endangerment that the defendant, one, used reasonable and appropriate physical force upon another person, two, when and to the extent that he reasonably believed it necessary to prevent, three, what he reasonably believed to be an attempt by the other person to commit theft. Notwithstanding the above, the defendant is not justified in using physical force if he was the initial aggressor, except that his use of physical force upon another person under the circumstances is justifiable if he withdraws from the encounter and effectively communicates to the other person his intent to do so, but the latter nevertheless continues or threatens the use of unlawful physical force. The defendant's theory of defense necessitates the adding of a less non-included offense, that of reckless endangerment. A person commits the crime of reckless endangerment if he recklessly engages in conduct, which creates a substantial risk of serious bodily injury to another person. The elements of reckless endangerment are therefore, one, recklessly engaging in conduct which creates a substantial risk of serious bodily injury, two, to another person. If, after considering all of the evidence, you find that the prosecution has established beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant, without affirmative defense, acted in such a manner as to satisfy all of the above elements at or about the date and place stated in the information, you should find the defendant guilty of reckless endangerment. If you do not so find, you should find the defendant not guilty of reckless endangerment. Concerning the instructions in this case,
Certain words or phrases have a particular meaning. The following is the definition of one of those words. Recklessly, a person acts recklessly when he consciously disregards a substantial and unjustifiable risk that a result will occur if any circumstance exists. An unlawful trespass occurs where a person goes on the property of another without a right or privilege to do so. Unlawful trespass does not occur when, in order to secure property of his own, a person goes upon the property of another. If you are not satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant is guilty of the offense of assault in the first degree as charged, he may, however, be found guilty of any lesser offense, the commission of which is necessarily included in the offense charged if the evidence is sufficient to establish his guilt of such lesser offense beyond a reasonable doubt. The offense of assault in the first degree as charged in the information necessarily includes the lesser offense of reckless endangerment. A person commits the crime of reckless endangerment if he recklessly engages in conduct which creates a substantial risk of serious bodily injury to another person. The elements of reckless endangerment are therefore one, recklessly engaging in conduct which creates a substantial risk of serious bodily injury, two, to another person. If, after considering all of the evidence, you find that the prosecution has established beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant, without affirmative defense, acted in such a manner so as to satisfy all of the above elements at or about the date and place stated in the information, you should find the defendant guilty of reckless endangerment. If you do not, Okay, this will be at 180. Ready? <clears throat> the court particularly addresses you, ladies and gentlemen. It is an affirmative defense to the crime of assault in the first degree and to the crime of reckless endangerment that the defendant, Gregory Pepper, used physical force upon the victim, Theodore Carnot. In one, in order to defend himself from what he reasonably believed to be the use of imminent use of unlawful physical force by Theodore Carnot. And two, he used a degree of force which he reasonably believed to be necessary for that purpose. Notwithstanding the above, the defendant is not justified in using physical force if he was the initial aggressor, except that his use of physical force upon another person under the circumstances is justifiable if he withdraws from the encounter and effectively communicates to the other person his intent to do so. But the latter nevertheless continues or threatens the use of unlawful physical force. It is an affirmative defense to the crime of assault in the first degree and to the crime of reckless endangerment that the defendant, one, was in possession or control of any building, realty, or other premises, or was licensed or privileged to be thereon, and two, used reasonable and appropriate physical force upon another person, three, to prevent or terminate what he reasonably believed to be the commission or attempted commission of an unlawful trespass by the other person in or upon the building, realty, or premises. Notwithstanding the above, the defendant is not justified in using physical force if he was the initial aggressor, except that his use of physical force upon another person under the circumstances is justifiable if he withdraws from the encounter and effectively communicates to the other person his intent to do so, but the latter nevertheless continues or threatens the use of unlawful physical force. It is an affirmative defense to the crime of assault in the first degree and to the crime of reckless endangerment that the defendant, one, used reasonable and appropriate physical force upon another person, two, when and to the extent that he reasonably believed it necessary to prevent, three, what he reasonably believed to be an attempt by the other person to commit theft. Notwithstanding the above, the defendant is not justified in using physical force if he was the initial aggressor, except that his use of physical force upon another person under the circumstances is justifiable if he withdraws from the encounter and effectively communicates to the other person his intent to do so but the latter nevertheless continues or threatens the use of unlawful physical force. The defendant's theory of defense necessitates the adding of a less non-included offense, that of reckless endangerment. A person commits the crime of reckless endangerment, a person, if he recklessly engages in conduct which creates a substantial risk of serious bodily injury to another person. The elements of reckless endangerment are therefore one, recklessly engaging in conduct which creates a substantial risk of serious bodily injury to, to another person. If, after considering all of the evidence, you find that the prosecution has established beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant, without affirmative defense, acted in such a manner so as to satisfy all of the above elements at or about the date and place stated in the information, you should find the defendant guilty of reckless endangerment. If you do not so find, you should find the defendant not guilty of reckless endangerment. 
Concerning the instruction in this case, certain words or phrases have a particular meaning. The following is the definition of one of the words. Recklessly. A person acts recklessly when he consciously disregards a substantial or unjustifiable risk that a result will occur or that a circumstance exists. An unlawful trespass occurs where a person goes on the property of another without a right or privilege to do so. Unlawful trespass does not occur when, in order to secure property of his own, a person goes upon the property of another. If you are not satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant is guilty of the offense of assault in the first degree as charged, he may, however, be found guilty of any lesser offense, the commission of which is necessarily included in the offense charged if the evidence is sufficient to establish his guilt of such lesser offense beyond a reasonable doubt. The offense of assault in the first degree, as charged in the information, necessarily includes the lesser offense of reckless endangerment. A person commits a crime of reckless endangerment if he recklessly engages in conduct which creates a substantial risk of serious bodily injury to another person. The elements of reckless endangerment are therefore, one, recklessly engaging in conduct which creates a substantial risk of serious bodily injury, two, to another person. If after considering all of the evidence, you find that the prosecution has established beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant, without affirmative defense, acted in such a manner so as to satisfy all of the above elements at or about the date and place stated in the information, you should find the defendant guilty of reckless endangerment. If you do not so find, you should find the defendant not guilty of reckless endangerment. Perhaps I have overemphasized reckless endangerment in these instructions, but it is essential that the prosecution to the prosecution that they must prove this beyond a shadow of a doubt. In this case, okay, and now at 190. Ready? The court particularly addresses you, ladies and gentlemen. It is an affirmative defense to the crime of assault in the first degree and to the crime of reckless endangerment that the defendant Gregory Pepper used physical force upon the victim, Theodore Carnot. One, in order to defend himself from what he reasonably believed to be the use or imminent use of unlawful physical force by Theodore Carnot. And two, he used a degree of force which he reasonably believed to be necessary for that purpose. Notwithstanding the above, the defendant is not justified in using physical force if he was the initial aggressor, except that his use of physical force upon another person under the circumstances is justifiable if he withdraws from the encounter and effectively communicates to the other person his intent to do so, but the latter nevertheless continues or threatens the use of unlawful physical force. It is an affirmative defense to the crime of assault in the first degree and to the crime of reckless endangerment that the defendant, one, was in possession or control of any building, realty, or other premises, or was licensed or privileged to be thereon, and two, use reasonable and appropriate physical force upon another person, three, to prevent or terminate what he reasonably believed to be the commission or attempted commission of an unlawful trespass by the other person in or upon the building, realty, or premises. Notwithstanding the above, the defendant is not justified in using physical force if he was the initial aggressor, except that his use of physical force upon another person under the circumstances is justifiable if he withdraws from the encounter and effectively communicates to the other person his intent to do so, but the latter nevertheless continues or threatens the use of unlawful physical force. It is an affirmative defense to the crime of assault in the first degree and to the crime of reckless endangerment that the defendant, one, used reasonable and appropriate physical force upon another person, two, when and to the extent that he reasonably believed it necessary to prevent, three, what he reasonably believed to be an attempt by the other person to commit theft. Notwithstanding the above, the defendant is not justified in using physical force if he was the initial aggressor except that his use of physical force upon another person under the circumstances is justifiable if he withdraws from the encounter and effectively communicates to the other person his intent to do so, but the latter nevertheless continues or threatens the use of unlawful physical force. The defendant's theory of defense necessitates the adding of a less non-included offense, that of reckless endangerment. A person commits the crime of reckless endangerment if he recklessly engages in conduct which creates a substantial risk of serious bodily injury to another person. The elements of reckless endangerment are therefore one, recklessly engaging in conduct which creates a substantial risk of serious bodily injury, two, to another person. If after considering all of the evidence, you find that the prosecution has established beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant, without affirmative defense, acted in such a manner so as to satisfy all of the above elements at or about the date and place stated in the information, 
you should find the defendant guilty of reckless endangerment. If you do not so find, you should find the defendant not guilty of reckless endangerment. Concerning the instructions in this case, certain words or phrases have a particular meaning. The following is the definition of one of the words. Recklessly, a person acts recklessly when he consciously disregards a substantial and unjustifiable risk that a result will occur or that a circumstance exists. An unlawful trespass occurs when a person goes on the property of another without a right or privilege to do so. Unlawful trespass does not occur when, in order to secure property of his own, a person goes upon the property of another. If you are not satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant is guilty of the offense of assault in the first degree as charged, he may, however, be found guilty of any lesser offense, the commission of which is necessarily included in the offense charged if the evidence is sufficient to establish his guilt of such lesser offense beyond a reasonable doubt. The offense of assault in the first degree, as charged in the information, necessarily includes the lesser offense of reckless endangerment. A person commits the crime of reckless endangerment if he recklessly engages in conduct which creates a substantial risk of serious bodily injury to another person. The elements of reckless endangerment are therefore, one, recklessly engaging in conduct which creates a substantial risk of serious bodily injury, two, to another person. If, after considering all of the evidence, you find that the prosecution has established beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant, without affirmative defense, acted in such a manner so as to satisfy all of the above elements at or about the date and place stated in the information, you should find the defendant guilty of reckless endangerment. If you do not so find, you should find the defendant not guilty of reckless endangerment. Perhaps I have overemphasized reckless endangerment in these instructions, but it is essential to the prosecution that they must prove this beyond a shadow of a doubt in this case. Okay, and we can go ahead, you can go ahead and get ready for your time writings. Okay, class, these are gonna be your tests. So we'll start with 180 jury charge number one proper names that you need to capitalize. You've got Mr. Foreman and that's it. Mr. Foreman, okay? And so you can actually write Mr. Foreman, M-R, F-M, F-M? One stroke, okay? M-R, F-M. This is gonna be then jury charge 180, number one, for five minutes and capitalize foreman, okay? Mr. Foreman and ladies and gentlemen of the jury, this case has been completed and you are to determine the issues of facts. In order to find the defendant guilty of the offense charged in count one of the indictment, the prosecution must establish three essential elements as follows. One, the defendant directly or indirectly engaged in any act, practice, or course of business which operates or would operate as a fraud or deceit upon any person. Two, said act, practice, or course of business was in connection with the offer, sale, or purchase of any security. Three, the defendant acted knowingly and willfully. The burden is on the prosecution to prove each of these elements beyond a reasonable doubt. The law never imposes on the defendant in a criminal case the burden of introducing any evidence or of calling any witnesses. To constitute a crime, there must be the joint operation of an act forbidden by law or an omission to perform an act required by law and a culpable mental state of the defendant. The culpable mental state in a case of securities fraud means willfully as this term is explained in these instructions. The culpable mental state in the case of conspiracy to commit securities fraud means to act with specific intent. The culpable mental state is just as much an element of the crime as the act. The culpable mental state must be proven beyond a reasonable doubt. As a matter of fact, either by direct or circumstantial evidence, the culpable mental state may be manifested by the circumstances connected with the perpetration of the offense and the sound mind and discretion of the defendant. Commission of the act alone does not warrant the presumption that the defendant had the requisite culpable mental state. A person acts willfully with respect to conduct or to a circumstance described by a statute defining an offense when he is aware that his conduct is of that nature or that the circumstance exists. 
specific intent is a state of mind voluntarily and willfully to do or perform an act which will effect a certain result. Such an act must not be the reason. The defendant's conscious object must be to cause a certain result. It is immaterial to the issue of specific intent whether or not the result actually occurred. You may also consider any demonstrated bias, prejudice, or hostility of a witness toward the defendant in determining the weight to be accorded to his or her testimony. An act, practice, or course of business is fraudulent if done with intent to deceive. To act with intent to defraud or deceive means an act knowingly and with the specific intent to deceive ordinarily for the purpose of either causing some financial loss to another or bringing about some financial gain to oneself. An act is done knowingly if done voluntarily and intentionally and not because of mistake or accident or other innocent reason. An omission or a failure to act is knowingly done if done voluntarily and intentionally and not because of mistake or accident or other innocent reason. The purpose of adding the word knowingly is to ensure that no one will be convicted for an act done or because of an omission or failure to act due to mistake or accident or other innocent reason. As stated before, with respect to an offense such, an, such as charged in this case, specific intent must be proved beyond reasonable doubt before there can be a conviction. An act is done willfully if done voluntarily and intentionally and with this specific intent to do something, the law forbids, that is to say with a bad purpose, either to disobey or to disregard the law. An omission or failure to act is willfully done if done voluntarily and intentionally and with the specific intent to fail to do something, the law requires to be done. That is to say with a bad purpose, either to disobey or to disregard the law. Unlawfully means contrary to law. So to do an act unlawfully means to do willfully something which is contrary to the law. Unlawfully to fail to act means willfully to fail to do something the law requires to be done. An act or an omission or failure to act is willfully done if done voluntarily and intentionally and with the specific intent to fail to do something the law requires to be done. That is to say with a bad purpose either to disobey or to disregard the law. In order to find the defendant guilty of the offense charged in counts 2 through 25 of the indictment, the prosecution must establish four essential elements as follows. One, the defendant directly or indirectly makes any untrue statement of a material factor or omits to state a material fact necessary in order to make the statements made in the light of the circumstances under which they are made not misleading. Two, the defendant is aware that he is making an untrue statement of a material fact or is aware that he is omitting to state a material fact necessary in order to make the statements made in the light of the circumstances under which they are made not misleading. Three, the defendant acts knowingly and willfully. Four, said statement or omission is in connection with the offer, sale, or purchase of any security. Okay. And then we have your second 180 jury charge, proper names. You have Mr. Foreman once again, okay? Mr. Foreman, capitalized Foreman. This is going to be 180 jury charge number two for five minutes. Mr. Foreman and ladies and gentlemen of the jury, if after considering all of the evidence you find that the prosecution has established each of the four elements beyond a reasonable doubt as to the defendant under consideration, you should find him guilty as charged in said count. If on the other hand, you should find that the prosecution has failed to establish any one of said elements beyond a reasonable doubt against the defendant under consideration, you should find him not guilty as charged in the count under consideration. A statement is untrue if it was false when made and it was then known to be false by the person making it or causing it to be made. A man or men may be visionary in their plans and believe that they will succeed and yet, in spite of their ultimate failure, be incapable of committing conscious fraud. Human tendencies may include among its victims even the supposed imposter. Under our system of laws, individuals are not punished criminally for mere mistakes, mere misjudgment, mere carelessness, or mere errors of judgment. They are punished only for intentional wrongdoing. The defendants here are not on trial for errors of judgment or mistakes or mismanagement, but are on trial for a criminal offense, and an essential element of that offense is a criminal intent which 
it is incumbent upon the prosecution to prove to your satisfaction and beyond a reasonable doubt before you will be warranted in returning a verdict of guilty. An admission or incriminatory statement made or act done by one defendant outside of court may not be considered as evidence against another defendant who is not present and so did not see the act done or hear the statement made. On the other hand, if the evidence in the case leaves the jury with a reasonable doubt whether the accused in good faith believed the statements made to be true at the time they were made, then the jury should acquit the accused. There are two types of evidence from which a jury may properly find the truth as to the facts of the case. One is direct evidence such as the testimony of an eyewitness, the other is circumstantial evidence that is the proof of facts or circumstances from which the existence or non-existence of other facts may reasonably be concluded. As a general rule, the law makes no distinction between direct and circumstantial evidence, but simply requires that before convicting a defendant, the jury must be satisfied of the defendant's guilt beyond a reasonable doubt from all the evidence in the case. If a party offers weaker and less satisfactory evidence when stronger and more satisfactory evidence could have been produced, you may view the evidence offered with suspicion. You must remember, however, that the defendant is not obligated to produce any evidence or to call any witnesses. If any reference by the court or by counsel to matters of evidence does not coincide with your own recollection, it is your recollection which should control during your deliberation. In this case, you must decide separately whether each of the charged defendants is guilty or not guilty. If you cannot agree upon a verdict as to all of the defendants but do agree as to one or more of them, you must render a verdict as to each such defendant upon which you do agree. It is your duty to give separate personal consideration to the case of each individual defendant. When you do so, you should analyze what the evidence in the case shows with respect to that individual, leaving out entirely any evidence admitted solely against some other defendant or defendants. Each defendant is entitled to have his case determined from evidence as to his own acts and mental culpability and any other evidence in this case which may be applicable to him. You must state your finding as to each defendant uninfluenced by your verdict as to the other defendant or defendants. Every person charged with a crime is presumed innocent. This presumption of innocence remains with the defendant throughout the trial and should be given effect by you unless after considering all of the evidence you are then convinced that the defendant is guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. The burden of proof is upon the prosecution to prove to the satisfaction of the jury beyond a reasonable doubt the existence of all of the elements necessary to constitute the crime charged. Reasonable doubt means a doubt based upon reason and common sense, which arises from a fair and rational consideration of all of the evidence or the lack of evidence in the case. It is a doubt which is not a vague, speculative, or imaginary doubt, but such a doubt as would cause reasonable people to hesitate to act in matters of importance to themselves. If you find from the evidence that each and every element has been proven beyond a reasonable doubt, you will find the defendant guilty. If you find from the evidence that the prosecution has failed to prove any one or more of the elements beyond a reasonable doubt, you will find the defendant not guilty. You will now go into the jury room to begin your deliberations. The bailiff will escort you. The bailiff will be right outside the jury room door to help you with anything. And we'll get ready for your 160s, okay? So we have 160 jury charge number one, capitalized government, and that's it. This will be jury charge number one, 160 for five minutes, you all. Members of the jury, you have now witnessed all of the evidence in the proceedings, as well as the closing arguments of the attorneys for the parties. It becomes my duty, therefore, to instruct you on the rules of law that you must follow and apply in reaching your decision in the case. In any jury trial, there are, in effect, two judges. I am one of the judges. The other is the jury. It is my obligation to preside over the trial and to decide what testimony and evidence is relevant under the law for your consideration. It is also my duty at the end of the trial to instruct you on the law that applies to the case. You as jurors are the sole judges of the facts, but in determining what really occurred in this case, that is in reaching your decision as to the facts, 
it is your sworn obligation to follow the law. I am now in the process of explaining to you. And you must follow all of my instructions as a whole. You have no right to disregard or give special attention to any one instruction or to question the wisdom or correctness of any rule I may present to you. That is, you must not substitute or follow your own interpretation or opinion as to what the law is or ought to be. It is your duty to apply the law as I give it to you, ignoring the results. By the same token, it is also your duty to decide your verdict completely upon the testimony and evidence in the case without prejudice or sympathy. That was the promise you made and the oath you took before being accepted by the parties as jurors in this case, and they have the right to anticipate nothing less. The indictment or formal charge against a defendant is not proof of that defendant's guilt. Indeed, the defendant is presumed by the law to be innocent. The law does not require a defendant to prove his innocence or to give any evidence at all. The government has the burden of proving him guilty past a reasonable doubt, and if the government fails to do so, you must acquit him. Thus, while the government's burden of proof is a strict or heavy burden, it is not necessary that the defendant's guilt be proved beyond any real doubt. It is only required that the government's proof exclude any reasonable doubt concerning the defendant's guilt. A reasonable doubt is a real doubt based upon reason and common sense after careful and impartial review of all the evidence in the case. Proof beyond a reasonable doubt then is proof of such a convincing character that you would be willing to rely and act upon it without hesitation in the most important of your own lives. If you are convinced that the accused has been proved guilty beyond a reasonable doubt, say so. If you are not convinced, say so. As outlined earlier, it is your duty to decide the facts and in so doing, you must consider only the evidence I have allowed in the case. The term evidence includes the testimony of the witnesses and the exhibits admitted in the record. Remember that any statements, objections, or arguments made by the attorneys are not evidence in the case. The function of the attorneys is to point out those things that are most significant or most helpful to their side of the case, and in so doing, to call your attention to certain facts or inferences that might otherwise escape your notice. In the final analysis, however, it is your own memory and interpretation of the evidence that controls in the case. What the lawyers say is not binding upon you. Thus, while you should consider only the evidence in the case, you're allowed to draw such reasonable inferences from the testimony and exhibits as you feel are right in the light of common experience. In other words, you may make deductions and reach conclusions which reason and common sense lead you to draw from the facts which have been established by the testimony and evidence in the case. You may also consider either direct or circumstantial evidence. Direct evidence is the testimony of one who asserts actual knowledge of a fact such as an eyewitness. Circumstantial evidence is proof of a chain of facts and circumstances showing either the guilt or innocence of the defendant. The law makes no distinction between the weight to be given to either direct or circumstantial evidence. It requires only that you weigh all of the evidence and be convinced of the defendant's guilt beyond a reasonable doubt before he can be convicted. A witness may be discredited or impeached by contradictory evidence by, and then we have number two, jury charge, no proper names, okay? This will be then test number two, 160 jury charge for five minutes, you all. Ladies and gentlemen, in a few minutes, I'll tell you the standards which apply to the defendant's conduct in our case here. And you must accept the standards as I give them to you. It will then be one of your tasks to decide if the plaintiff has proved by a preponderance of the evidence that the defendant has fallen below the standard which the law 
expects of him in this particular instance. To put it briefly, you will have to determine if the plaintiff has proved that the defendant has engaged in substandard conduct and is thus in legal terms at fault. And in this case, the plaintiff alleges that the defendant has committed the kind of fault which the law calls negligence. But this is only one of the facets of the plaintiff's case. And I have already told you that in order to be successful, the plaintiff must prove all the essential parts of his case. The other facets are the following. One, that the injury the plaintiff suffered was in fact caused by the conduct of the defendant. And two, that there was actual damage to the plaintiff's person. As to the requirement, as to the requirement that plaintiff's injury be caused by defendant's conduct, I do not mean that the law recognizes just one cause of injury consisting of just one factor or thing or the acts of just one person. On the contrary, many factors or things may operate at the same time, either alone or combined to cause the injury or damage. You should solve this question by deciding if plaintiff would likely not have suffered the claim damage in the absence of defendant's conduct. If plaintiff would have suffered those injuries, regardless of what the plaintiff, the defendant did, then you must conclude that the injuries were not caused by the defendant and find a verdict for the defendant. If on the other hand, plaintiff likely would not have suffered the claimed injuries in the absence of defendant's conduct, then you must find that the defendant's acts did play part in the plaintiff's injuries and you must then go to the next part. In a personal injury suit, plaintiff bears the burden of proving a causal link between the injury sustained and the accident which caused the injury. Plaintiff must prove causation by a preponderance of the evidence. The test for deciding the causal link between the accident and the injury is if the plaintiff proved through the medical testimony that it is more likely than not that the subsequent damage was caused by the accident. Plaintiff is aided in this burden of proving causation by the presumption that a claimant's damage is presumed to have resulted from an accident if before the event, the injured person was in good health, but after the event, the symptoms of the trauma should appear and also manifest well afterward, providing that the medical evidence shows there to be a reasonable chance of causal link between the accident and the disabling condition. In order to defeat the presumption, the defendant must show some other incident which could have caused the injury that's in question. The second facet of the plaintiff's case, which you must address is if the defendant's conduct was below the standard applied to his actions. In this case, the basic standard applying is a requirement that the defendant use that degree of care, which we might reasonably expect from a prudent person under the same or similar circumstances you will see that this is a relative term. The care which we reasonably expect from any prudent person will vary according to the events facing him. And notice too that the conduct we set up as a standard is not that of an extremely cautious person or the exceptionally skillful one, but that of a person of ordinary prudence. Now, while normal caution or skill is to be admired, the law does not demand it as a standard of care in this case. The ordinarily prudent person will avoid creating an unreasonable risk of harm. And in deciding whether or not the defendant breached this standard and caused an unreasonable risk of harm, you may weigh the likelihood that someone might have been injured and the degree of that injury against the impact to society of what the defendant was doing and the correctness of the way in which he was doing it under the conditions. Now, a prudent person will usually obey the laws which apply to his acts, but in extreme conditions, even violation of the law may be reasonable. You must decide in light of all the events if a prudent person in the defendant's position would be reasonable in violating a law. If so, then the breach is not substandard conduct, but if not, the breach is unreasonable and thus below the standard of care to which Okay, you all, that concludes your test. Have a great day and type them up. They were good, okay? Have a wonderful day.